How do you hold it together? That's a question that frequently is asked of people enduring life-crushing events. Uh, Maybe going through pain, hurt, loss, hardship, crises. And, and, And maybe we look at them, at least from the outside... We think to ourselves, um, man, they appear to be holding up remarkably well. Looks like there is endurance and composure and strength. We admire their character, their maturity, their stability. Uh, Marvel at it and long that when we're in that same kind of crises and difficulty that we might be of of the same temperament. So that's frequently why we might uh, raise that question, how do you keep it together? How do you hold it together? But I'm going to ask the same question from a little bit different venue. Actually, they overlap somewhat. Because it's a question that, that we need to ask relative to the community of believers in Jesus, what we call the body of Christ, as the Romans chapter 12 references us here. We are one body, many members, one body. We noted several weeks ago, three times in those couple of verses that's, that's cited. How does the body of believers in Jesus, the community of those who know Jesus as Savior and Lord, how do we function in a way that sustains, that, that keeps us together as a community, as a body of of believers, knowing there are so many opposing forces. How do we hold it together? Think of the opposing forces we face. The scriptures remind us we have, we have demonic forces, Satan and the demons themselves. Ephesians chapter 2 reminds us that we fight against uh, the prince of the power of the air. And there is very clear from the whole book of Acts and the New Testament letters, we see occasion after occasion where where Satan is set against not only destroying as he was set against destroying Jesus before the cross. Satan is set against the body of Christ that he is committed to build. Jesus said, I will build my church. He's set against destroying what, that is Satan set against destroying what what Jesus is building. So we've got those spiritual enemies from beyond. Then we have the enemy of our own sinful flesh. And Paul reminds us in Ephesians 2, we, we fight against the lusts of our flesh and, and our own sinfulness comes in the way. It's the same stuff that breaks up relationships, doesn't it? Relationships in family, relationships among friends, There is destruction of personal relationships and there is a destruction of oneness and community among believers in Jesus as well as it's true within our biological families. And and that's a real destructive force because of our own selfishness and our own sinfulness and, and our own blindness and our own foolishness and we destroy what God wants to bring together. And so we have to fight against our own sinfulness. And then we've got to fight against our culture. Right? Paul, Ephesians chapter 2, the way of this world. We have, we have this culture that we're warring against uh, in addition to, to warring against our own sin and against, and against uh, the, the demonic forces from beyond. We've got a culture that mitigates against what God's doing to make believers in Jesus and the church of Jesus Christ unique and distinct. And then we've got further opposition from from governing forces. You look at the New Testament epistles and you've got Roman authorities and Roman persecution taking place and growing and expanding. And and we're living in a world, believers in Jesus, far worse than us, who, who, who by the thousands upon thousands upon thousands are being slaughtered by governing forces that were designed to protect. That's coming in Romans chapter 13. And so we've got, we've got additional enemy pursuits from those who rule above and presume upon an entrustment of authority that God intended for them to fulfill. And then we've got on top of all of that opposing forces of religious systems of all kinds, of all shapes and sizes that create added dimensions and difficulties. Add to that many who rise up speaking in the name of 
Jesus, false prophets, false teachers, deceiving even the elect of God. I mean, think of all the opposing forces that we are up against, given the cursed world, sinful world, and our own sinfulness, all that's there. How does the church keep it together? How do we hold it together? Listen, let's be clear. Jesus made a promise, and I confess to you, there are more times than I can, I can consider where I wonder, how in the world are you going to fulfill this promise? How are you doing it now, 2,000 years later? He told the apostles, I will build my church. I will build, that's up, my church. That, that's his promise. Well, that's his commitment. And, and we know that from the book of Romans, chapters 3, 4, 5, 6, and following, that he's the one who is the establisher of the true church of Jesus Christ. Those who turn from their sin, place their faith in Jesus, believing he is the one who met the penalty for my sinfulness that I deserved. He took all that punishment upon himself. He's the Lamb of God. And as we'll see, portrayed in the Passover again next week, He's the Passover lamb, the once for all sacrifice who took all of the wrath of God upon himself so that when we come to Jesus, he brings new life, spiritual life, implants his life in me. He makes me anew, a new creature in Christ. He does that. And in in doing that, he's also one committed then to produce this nucleus of a body of believers with common confession in Jesus Christ. He's the creator of the church. He produces Romans chapter 12 and verses 4 and 5, many members, one body. In Ephesians chapter 2, he's the head of the body. He's Lord from the above, from the outside, and he also is Lord from the, from the inside, filling all in all. He is our head. He's formed it. He's created it. He's established it. His vision that we noted in John 17, praying for us, in John 17, verses 21 to 23, his desire is that we might be one. One body, diverse in giftedness, Diverse in makeup, diverse in background, but yet one, a unity with, with diversity. His prayer for us is that, is that we function even his own prayer. Even, Father, as I am in you and you are in me, the, the function of the Godhead becomes a model for the health of the body of Christ. So that's what he's out to do. And he told his own disciples, by this all men will know that you are my committed followers if you love one another, even as I have loved you. So there becomes the the model again. It's sacrificial. It's surrender. We saw that in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, right? It's surrender and sacrifice. All of me is yours. So it's clear what his intention is. What's more, when he indwells us individually, he indwells us corporately. We know that Jesus indwells every believer in Jesus. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19, we are the, the temple of God the Holy Spirit. Romans chapter 8, we saw that. Jesus is in you and the Spirit of God indwells you. What's remarkable is that because he indwells us individually, the local body of believers that comes together for worship, for evangelism, and for ministry is corporately indwelt by him as well. It's an interesting statement that Paul makes in in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 16. And and both of these statements are made in 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 19 says, Don't you know that your body is the temple of God the Holy Spirit who indwells you? And there in 1 Corinthians 6 verse 19, he's addressing individual believers in Jesus. Each of you, every one of you, repentant, regenerated 
having spiritual life, new life in Christ, individually, God the Holy Spirit indwells you, seals you, and gifts you, empowers you. That's 1 Corinthians 6, 19. But back up to 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 16, and a similar statement is made, but it's not addressing individual believers. It's hard to see in the English. It's much clearer in the Greek. Here he is addressing the corporate community of believers in Jesus. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16. Don't you not, do you not know, rhetorical question, answer is implied. Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? And a better translation of that is the Brooklynese translation. The Brooklynese translation nails this well. Because the Brooklynese translation would say this, Don't use guys know that use guys are the temple of the living God and that the Spirit of God dwells in use. That's the Brooklynese translation. It gets the plural pronoun in there. He's speaking not of the individual believer, but of the church community. So God the Holy Spirit, Jesus, not only indwells every individual believer who becomes part of this one body of which he's the head. But by virtue of that, God the Holy Spirit, the temple of God, the dwelling place of God, is also the corporate body of believers. Well, that's kind of pretty cool. Now, when you consider that, here's here's the handover. Here's the entrustment. Here's the challenge and responsibility given to individual believers in Jesus and to the corporate community of believers. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 3. The Apostle Paul in Ephesians and Romans are paralleled letters with similar themes approaching from slightly different angles. In Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 3, Paul says to this body of believers, corporately the temple of God, individually the temple of God, spirit of God indwelling individually as well as, as well as corporately. The words are important. Be diligent, Paul says, to preserve the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. Every word is critical. We don't create unity. He does. By redeeming us, saving us, washing away our sin, regenerating us, bringing new life in Christ, removing the power of the old nature, plugging in the new nature, He creates spiritual life. He did it in me. He's done it in you if you've placed your faith in Jesus. He produces Romans 12, verses 4 and 5, one body, diverse and unique, many members, but one body. He creates the corporate body of Christ, of which he's the head. And then a sacred handoff, if you will, occurs. Not exclusively. It's not like he's saying, I'm done, I did it, and I'm out of here. He's partnering, he's indwelling us, he's doing his work in us, but he entrusts to us as solemn a privilege as one could ever dream of. I'm summoning you, calling you, requiring you, empowering and gifting you to preserve, to protect, to guard the unity that I have created. Now that doesn't come easy which is why Ephesians 4.1 begins with this verb, be diligent, which means this is going to require all of your energy, all of your focus, all of your attention, all of your burden, all of your vision. It's not a roller coaster that lets go of the cars and it just flows with centrifugal force. This is going to require a tremendous level of commitment, keeping in mind all the obstacles we got including our own short-sightedness, our own stupidness, our own sinfulness, our own bullheadedness, and yours too. (laughs) 
We got, we got all this stuff working against us, but the entrustment's here. And Jesus has given us all those principles to help us be preservers and protectors and guardians of what he alone creates. So Ephesians 4, 3, be diligent to preserve, protect, defend, guard, maintain that oneness that he's established so that there can be among us this one body of many members, peace. Shalom. He's the prince of peace. He's the source of peace. We have everything we need to be preservers and protectors and guardians of the peace. We better be committed to that task. Because it's not just small fries. It's not insignificant. Can't take it lightheartedly. This needs to be uh, something we're sold out to be. And so here we are back to Romans chapter 12. A reflection now of our absolute surrender to the Lordship of Jesus Christ from Romans 12, 1 and 2, right? We get all he's done for us. I give myself to him. That's going to now begin to impact the, the vertical with him will begin now to impact the horizontal first Believers in Jesus, the core family and community that we are a part of, that body of which he is the head. And, and, and if we're going to function together and preservers of unity, we saw in verse 3 the requirement of that key attribute that we spent some time on, didn't we, in verse 3. A couple of weeks, just in, just in verse 3. We can't afford to look at ourselves, verse 3, more highly than we ought to think. Can't, can't afford to think of ourselves as better than, smarter than, more important than. Can't be condescending. Can't be proud, pompous, and, 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 uh, and, and presume that, that there's no way they can do it without me. And I know better than you, and I'm wiser than you, and you're just a peon. Can't, can't, can't do that. That's 1 Corinthians 14 disaster. You know, that, that's I'm more important than you. The hand says to the eye. The eye says to the hand. I mean, it's kind of a fun illustration. I wish we had time to go through the illustration of the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 14 with spiritual gifts. I mean, can you imagine if the eye said to the feet, I'm more important than you are because without me, you have no idea where you're walking because I see and you don't. And then the foot looks at the eye and says, you're an idiot. Because you can see all you want, but you ain't getting to where you want to go without me. So he uses the absurdity of the parts of the body and the, the unity, the oneness, diversity, but unity that we struggle with so greatly. If we're going to find this kind of oneness in diversity, if we're going to be this one body with many members, the goal in functioning we saw at the end of verse 4, just as we have many members in one body, all members don't have the same function. The Greek word praxis. The first hit of what's to flow in verses 6, 7, and 8. Because what God has done is put together a family of believers where there is oneness. And in that diversity, the amazing factor is he molds our personality, a lot of the DNA that's there, that, that's part of his divine creation. I mean, we're, we're his workmanship, you know? It, we marvel from, from, the, from Psalm 1, 139 uh, that, that God weaves together every aspect of our of our makeup in the womb, so many of our core personality traits and, and those features that make us unique and special are by divine design. And in the omniscience of God, in the, in the purpose of God, knowing us before we were his, he, he wove all those character traits together, knowing in time and space he would bring us to a place in our journey where we would turn from our sin and we would embrace Jesus as our savior and the miraculous work comes, he indwells us. Now, what we didn't know until here, while chapter 8 talks about God the Holy Spirit indwelling us, Jesus indwelling us, 
we now have this sense of awareness that something else happened that we had no idea occurred. Verse 6. We have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. Whoa. The Greek word is charisma, from which we get the word grace and gift. And what Paul's telling us is the same thing that he expands upon in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 11 where Paul said in 1 Corinthians 12, 11, the one and the same God, the Holy Spirit, who indwells us, distributes by his own sovereign choice and will to all believers in Jesus, indwelt by the Spirit of God, who are a part of the body of Christ, entrust to us by his grace, charisma, spiritual gifts, supernatural enablements for the purpose of ministry. By by one spirit, we are all placed into that community. So here's what happened. It's like a bigger picture. God brings me to a place where I realize I'm a sinner, I'm lost, I'm under God's judgment and wrath, and I'm starting to get all that, and I realize I'm in big trouble. And I realize Jesus came, he died for me, he rose for me, he's my savior. I turn from my sin, oh Jesus, forgive me, wash me. I believe you are the one who paid that price for my sin. There's nothing I can do to enhance that. And so I I ask you to forgive me and wash me and cleanse me. And at that moment, what happens? God cleanses me, washes me. The spirit of God indwells in me. Jesus indwells me. He regenerates me, gives me spiritual life. And lo and behold, not only in chapter 6 did he unplug this old nature and plug in the new nature so I have a whole new power source to equip me for life. I can become a new creature in Christ. But he did something else. Cool. What else did he do? When he came, he brought with him a specially designed suitcase with your initials on him. That suitcase had inside, opened up, a supernatural gift by the grace of God. The same grace that saves you and me, I'm undeserving. I can't earn this. Is the same grace that puts this suitcase inside your soul and new life, unpacks it, and there is a supernatural gift or gifts because Paul says in 1 Corinthians 12 verse 11, he gives severally as he wills meaning that every individual believer in Jesus may well have more than one of these supernatural entrustments and enablements. A minimum of one. Many have more. Unpack that suitcase, and what's discovered is that everything that God has molded in us from the time of our conception, equipped us for, through the early part of our journey, all the stuff that's happened to us, all the experiences that we endure and go through, all of the, everything kind of comes together, new life's implanted within, and God molds everything that we are by our DNA, everything that we have been by our life, couples it with these supernatural enablements for service and says, voila, new creature. Remarkable. It is all a gift of God's grace. The Apostle Peter comments on this same truth in, in a brief statement in, in 1 Peter chapter, chapter 4 and, and verse 10. Peter said there in 1 Peter 4.10, As each one has received a charisma, supernatural spiritual gift, Each one of you, again, same truth as Paul, every believer in Jesus has received, notice we don't don't find our own, we're receivers of it. It's implanted by him within. Each one of you has received this charisma, this supernatural spiritual giftedness for ministry. Our challenge is to employ it, put it to work, meaning it's got to be cultivated and developed while God implants the seed, our, our privilege is the cultivation, development, the use, 
through, through good times and bad, through success and failure. It's something we're partners in growing by using. Employ it in serving one another. The goal is the body of believers in Jesus because we are called to be good stewards of the manifold grace of God. So just like your salvation is a gift of God's grace that you and I are privileged to share with those who are lost, your supernatural gift implanted in that suitcase that God's unraveled for you is also yours to cultivate, develop, and use. It's remarkable. How do you do that? It's part of what gives us value. When Paul said to the church in Ephesus in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10, we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus under good works, this is part of it. You are the craftsmanship of the eternal God who from the womb on has designed you, created you, equipped you, gifted you, prepared you for supernatural stuff that nobody else can do like you, for you. Doesn't that give you a sense of value, purpose, giftedness, significance? Almighty God has done this in me. Did I earn it? Did I win it as a badge? No. It's grace gift. It's charisma. It's his work in me. And that's where we are now in these several verses. We've seen our partnership in the family, verses 4 and 5, 6, 7, and 8. Here is our design and purpose in serving one another. Now, Romans is a late epistle. If you want to look at a definitive place to find what are these supernatural gifts for ministry for the body of Christ, this is the definitive passage. The others in 1 Corinthians are correcting disaster. Last place I want to go is build my theology upon disaster. He's correcting what the Corinthians had no clue of what they were doing because they saw themselves as greater. And then there were others because they were so oppressive with their pompous, arrogant pride. That's the other part of Romans 12, 3. We can't afford to look at ourselves greater, nor can we afford to look at ourselves lower. We can't look down on hooper, hooper froneo. We have to have... A sophroneo, sound, clear judgment. That's what Romans 12, 3 is talking about. Clear thinking. I'm, I'm not going to see myself way up here, but I'm also not going to see myself way down here. Man, if God's done that in me, if he's indwelling me, if he's unpacked this suitcase in me, if he's designed me to be his workmanship, if he's given me supernatural gifts to be able to serve him, man, am I important by the grace of God. Balanced thinking. So when you look at this list in verses 6, 7, and 8, what I want you to see is you can really categorize them into two groups. And that's what many do. It's rather apparent. You've got three of these seven gifts that I call speaking gifts. And that's where we are very quickly to go over this morning. There is the first one on the list, the gift of prophecy that we'll explain and unravel. And then the third on the list in verse 7 the second of the speaking gifts, the gift of teaching. See that? You got prophecy, teaching, and then the very next one, the beginning of verse 8, the gift of exhortation. So you got three gifts that involve verbal communication, supernatural enablements designed by using the truth of God in the lives of believers to produce building up of the body of Christ. Preaching, teaching, exhortation. The other four in the list are not primarily speaking gifts, but sometimes we call them serving gifts, gifts in in which we're coming alongside of people and doing less than we are saying, but still with the equal power and authority to build up believers in Jesus. And those four are found uh, in the beginning of verse 7, serving, and then uh, uh, 5 and, uh, yeah, then verse 8, the other three linked together, the gift of giving, leading, and mercy. So you got seven gifts, three speaking, four serving. All believers in Jesus are called to do all seven of these in one form or another. Some are supernaturally gifted to be able to kind of stand in the front of the pack and show us how it's done and produce the greatest impact. 
So let's look at these couple briefly. Chapter 12 and verse 6. Since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let each exercise them accordingly. And then the first on the list, if prophecy according to the proportion of his faith. The gift of of prophecy. Now, already we have a problem because of how we interpret the word. The Greek word propheteia, from which we get the word prophet. And and instinctively in the mind of, of many of us, when we hear the word prophecy or prophet, what's the first thing that comes to our mind? You go back to the Old Testament, right? You think of the Old Testament prophets. And then we all also then go where some denominations go and screw the whole thing up to smithereens. Blow it, blow it to smithereens. Because immediately we think not only of Old Testament prophets, which is already a false assumption. Secondly, we also then go to the presumption of the predictive element. We go back and think of future. And we think to ourselves, ah, the gift of prophecy means they're going to they're gonna stand up and announce what's going to happen next week, next month, next year, next decade. Predicting the future. And we blow the whole thing to smithereens. Completely. One, it's not what the word means. And two, frankly, it's not even what the Old Testament prophets did. Study the prophets carefully and what you will find is 90% of their public ministry and their writings have to do with current events, current scenes, real life as it's happening to them, to their people, real issues, real problems with with kings who were ungodly or enemy peoples who were oppressing. What they were doing was declaring the word of God given to them. So you often hear, thus saith the Lord. They were declaring the truth of God, the revelation of God, the word of God to the people of God in the time in which they lived. Which matches what the word means. Because the word propheteia means to declare forth. To speak forth. To announce boldly divine truth. Now, that's 90% of what the Old Testament prophets did. Frankly, when you look at the New Testament scriptures, that's 90% and more of what the New Testament prophets did because virtually all of it had to do with contemporary scene, contemporary issues, contemporary churches, contemporary sin, contemporary problems, contemporary priorities in building up and establishing and preserving the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace, small piece of the pie, dealt with future stuff. So we're going to blow up our priest's conceptions when we, when we start this. The ministry of propheteia, better translated, preaching, speaking forth, declaring the truth of the inspired word of God. Believing 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is inspired by God. Remember when Paul stated that in the context, he's talking about Old Testament as well as New Testament, New Scripture. All scripture is God-breathed. It comes from the very essence, the very nature, the very throne of Almighty God and is profitable to declare, to build up the body of Christ. The ministry of those who are the prophets or the preachers is in declaring that truth. In the words of Peter in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 11, they are to speak, as it were, the utterances of God. Wow. Maybe that tells us why it's mentioned first on the list, because sequence in lists is usually important. Maybe it's suggestive of the fact that those who are declarers of divine truth, thus saith the Lord, generally found to a large audience. So you have one manifestation at one time of that one gift potentially impacting multitudes in one moment. So that may be an indicator of why it's listed high. Along with its purpose in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 3, to convict, to teach, to instruct, to console, to comfort, to exhort its divine 
divine purpose. Significant that the attachment to this gift in in verse 6, there is this postscript. If you've been given the gift of prophecy, prophetia, preaching, speaking the, the revelation of God, do it according to the proportion of one's faith. Which simply means this. The effectiveness of the preaching ministry of the one who will preach will largely be determined by how confident that preacher is of the truth of the word of God and revelation he's been given. Proportion is percentage. How much confidence, how much assurance, how much boldness is there that I have in what it is I am declaring of the truth of God, the word of God, one that it's accurate, one that I'm cutting it straight, 2 Timothy 2.15, the the importance to to be diligent, to study accurately, rightly handling the, the word of truth. How confident and assured I am in the authority and sufficiency of the word of God because of what it is of the truth of God because I'm, I'm confident that God has disclosed and allowed me by illumination to see and, and to understand that truth, the degree to which I'm confident in it is the degree to which the proclamation will ultimately bear, bear fruit. If I'm timid, if I'm unsure, if I don't get it, if I don't see it, if I don't know it, you know, I, I can masquerade by whatever human ingenuity, you know, some type of uh, overwhelming way to convince people. There are a lot of those shucksters out there with no clue of what the truth is. And people can be deceived and, you know, walk off with all kinds of stuff. But really, ultimately, the word of God will take root in the heart of the child of God when the truth of God declared in the power of the Holy Spirit of God unmasks and unveils the truth of divine revelation so the Spirit of God can produce conviction and repentance and encouragement and admonition and building up, all that occurs. Not because of the proclaimer, but because of what's being proclaimed. Note that this gift is nowhere exclusively entrusted to pastors. In fact, we'll get to the next one here, transitioning to teaching. The only spiritual gift in the New Testament that is absolutely connected to the shepherd pastor is the spiritual gift of teaching. That's a requirement. First, Ephesians 4, verse 11, pastor teachers. That's the required spiritual gift. So not all pastors are preachers. If you're called of God to be a shepherd and a pastor, you have to be one gifted to teach. Because if you don't have the spiritual gift of teaching, you're barking up a wrong tree. They, they, they go together. So you can say, not all pastors are prophetia preachers. They have to be teachers. And prophetia preachers, they're not all pastors. Meaning there are some in the body of Christ who are given the supernatural gift to tell forth, declare forth the truth of God, the word of God, who aren't necessarily shepherds and pastors. They just are gifted and they're able to employ that gift in in groups and whether in a local church or or in some other means, they, they don't have to be pastors. Does that kind of blow you a little bit apart? A little mind blowing? We can also say all preachers must be teachers because you have to have the truth of the word of God to be able to declare it in order to be used of the spirit of God to convince to life change. But not all teachers are preachers, which we'll get to right here. Let me go one more. Stretch the brain. The gift of preaching in itself is nowhere found to be gender specific. 
audience is specific, but the gift is not specific. There are evidences in the New Testament of, of women who had that giftedness. It was the audience in which they exercised it that the scriptures provided some boundaries to. First Timothy chapter 2, exercising authority, preaching, teaching over men, absolutely forbidden. Nothing to do with better than, smarter than, gifted than, nothing to do with that whatsoever. It's divine order, which we don't even have time to get into. But if you want to, we'll do that some other time. The goal of preaching is life transformation. It is the truth of God used by the Spirit of God to produce the change of God in the heart of the child of God. Now, interesting, the second on the list is one we'll get to next week. We'll explain why it's listed there separately. But you've got to get down to the end of verse 7. If he who teaches in his teaching, and the in his teaching is just simply repeated that pattern, simply saying this, if God's given you the spiritual gift of teaching, you better be using it. You're not on the shelf. You're not idle. There may be blocks of time where it ain't going to happen 24-7, you know, seven days a week, four months, four weeks of the month, 12 months of the year, but there's got to be a regularity in which if God's given you the gift, you've got to use it. Now, it, it, the, the word in, in verse 7, teaching didaskan, didaskalos, basically means a, a systematic declaration of divine truth. It has the idea of instructing thoroughly what the scripture has to, to say. It's guiding into all truth. It's informing, which is why 2 Timothy 2.15, be diligent to show yourself approved unto God, a workman who needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. There's got to be, there's got to be devotion to study, to understand divine truth, and effectiveness in being able to communicate divine truth, which is understandable and can be grasped by those who hear. So it's one thing if I have a brilliant mind to be able to perceive and understand divine truth that's profound. But if I can't bring that to hearers in a way that they're able to digest and grasp and process at a level in which they're at, well, that's a problem. Maybe the gift should be in writing or something, or, but, but, but difficult if there isn't the ability to communicate in a way that's, that's digestible, that's comprehensible. It's much of what God the Holy Spirit is designed to do in our lives from John 14 and John 16. It's his ministry to guide us into all truth. And God the Holy Spirit will use those with the spiritual gift of teaching to allow us to see and comprehend that divine truth. So the goal and intention of teaching is more instructional where the goal and intention of preaching is more transformational. It's not that teaching doesn't desire to see life transformation, but its primary purpose is to help believers understand truth, which is why in Acts chapter 2, verse 42, when the first church met together in Jerusalem, they were devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, didaskalos. Because for the first time, these new believers in Jesus were understanding by the apostles' preaching the connection between the old covenant and the new covenant the connection between the ministry of all the the feasts and the sacrifices and the prophets and Jesus and who he was and why he came and what he did. It was like lights going on, bridges were being built, and like, whoa, I never knew that. That's cool. That's really neat. They were devoting themselves because they were hungry to understand the new revelation that God was given. And so they hungered for, for that teaching, for that understanding. All preachers must be teachers, not all teachers are preachers. And the audience for teaching, where preaching is generally group, there's nothing that suggests that to be the case. In fact, just the opposite. Teaching can be a spiritual gift manifested one-on-one, one-on-two. In fact, Paul notes this as his theme for disciple-making following rabbinic tradition in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, you remember this? Uh, you therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that's in Christ Jesus and the things which you've heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, that's group, 
These entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Principle of multiplication. I impact several of you. You break down and impact others. But a small group can be one-on-one, one-on-two, where so much of teaching can also occur. And so there's two of the speaking gifts, preaching, teaching. Last one that referenced here in verse 8 is a fascinating word and a fascinating term. Last of the three preaching gifts, preaching, teaching, and then the gift of exhortation. The Greek word parakaleo, compound word, uh, simply means to challenge, kaleo, the, the prefix para meaning alongside. You're coming alongside of somebody, often a one-on-one speaking gift to encourage, to exhort, to challenge. It's the same root word as Jesus gave to the Holy Spirit in John 14 and John 16. Remember Jesus said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to be gone, but I'm going to give you another, another paraclete. Same root word. One who's going to come alongside of you, who will be in you, who will be there to exhort you, to encourage you, to minister you, to indwell you, to teach you, to direct you. Here's a, a supernatural gift, exhortation or encouragement, where we are advising, pleading, warning, challenging, comforting, strengthening, uplifting to those believers who might be discouraged or depressed or overwhelmed or fearful, going through testing, going through trials. It's the gift where counseling is frequently found. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 14, Paul said, We urge you, brethren, admonish the unruly, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with all men. Romans chapter 15 and verse 14 I encourage you, my brethren, I myself also am convinced that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, and able also to admonish, here's a form of the word, one another. The key of the gift of exhortation is right there in Romans 15, 14. It's based on the assumption that we're filled with all knowledge, that we're understanding the truth of God, the principles of God, the word of God. Let me make this real clear. In an age that's driving me increasingly nuts. Mm -hmm. I'm sick and tired of hearing the word life coach. That's a new one. It's been out there for you. I'm sick and I wish it would blow up. Because that's what we've turned churches into and pastors into. Or people will come and sprinkle feel good. I want to feel good. I want to smile. Give me a spiritual heroin injection so I can leave here and feel good about life and good about me. If Tuesday I'm falling apart, I don't care. I just need a few hours of peace. Make me feel good. Tell me life, wonderful things. Life coach kind of mentality. Often void of any kind of spiritual truth that undergirds it because the ministry of exhortation involves using the truth of God, the word of God, to the life of the believer of God to address their need. And sometimes that hurts because that's what the scripture does for us individually. The word of God is profitable for for truth. And then 2 Timothy 3.16, reproof. Reproof we don't like. That's the finger of God, the spirit of God pointing at me saying, listen, your thinking on this issue is your own worst enemy. Listen, this is a sin issue. This, This walking around moping, victimized, feeling sorry for yourself, this walking around in this in this malaise. You're not claiming who you are. You're not living by the truth. You're living in lies of deception. You don't need a stroke to feel good. You need to repent because of who you are really in Jesus and discovering that and believing the truth and making decisions based upon what's true, not what I feel. So that, oh, you hurt me. Well, conviction's supposed to hurt. When you're a kid and you're out of line and parents whop the butt, It's not likely you said, thank you, that felt good. Can you do some more? 
You missed the other side. I looked in the mirror. Only half is red. Could you please make the other half match? Yes, discipline for the moment is, Hebrews 12, painful. Yes, but afterwards it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness. So exhortation without the word of God is a waste. So all three of these require an understanding of divine revelation, divine truth, in order for the Spirit of God to use it. So these are just three speaking gifts. We got four serving gifts yet ahead. But how do we keep it together? How do we hold it together? How are we as a community of believers going to continue to be one body, many members, preservers, unity of the spirit, bond of peace? How are we going to praxis or, or, or function? How are we going to be God's workmanship? It's only going to happen when all of those supernaturally gifted by God use and employ those gifts for the building up of the body of Christ. And the three dominant speaking gifts, preaching, teaching, exhortation, help provide a forum of thinking that believers in Jesus can buy into and encourage them to allow to be all that God's designed us to be. But they're all needed. The speakers can't function without the servers. I'll tell you more about that next week. Are you thankful that God has, you may not know what your spiritual gifts are, but I hope you're, you're excited to thought, man, to think that maybe one, maybe more in me? Yeah. Not maybe, definitely. Uncovering that, unwrapping that, discovering that, employing that, using that, not only will bring you the greatest joy of your life, per- purpose, workmanship, but to think that God's going to use you and is and has and will continue to build up others in Jesus, what greater privilege can there be than that? That's the joy of burnt offering sacrifice discovered. Let's pray. Lord God, help us to find that which you've given us by your grace. In finding it humbled, surrendering to you, all that you are making us in Jesus, that you might use us as a community of believers, one body yet diversity, unique in our giftedness, desiring to lift you up, not ourselves, desiring to exalt Jesus, not ourselves, desiring that you be recognized, not us, that you be glorified, that the world might know that we are your disciples. Use us, with that passion, that commitment, that zeal, in Jesus' name, amen.